thank you all so much for coming. Um, this is the Celebrity Culture Club and I'm Dr Hannah Yellen. Um, we've got a stratospherically good panel of speakers covering that range uh, of perspectives uh, on celebrity culture. And specifically today, the peculiar celebrity of the British royal family. So, and um, what of today's theme? Um, well, with the 20th anniversary of the death of Princess Diana, um, the day after tomorrow, our theme could not be more timely. And as with the goal of generally looking at celebrity culture, um, we couldn't have a better case study for interrogating um, some of the, uh, I've used the word peculiar, but the, yeah, the kind of weird facets and kind of structural conditions of celebrity culture. At our last event, hands up if you came to our last event. Bless you, thank you very much for coming back again. <laughs> the royals kept naturally coming up, both um, as they were kind of exemplary uh, of the dynamics that we were talking about with celebrity culture more generally, and also because they were um, this strange outlier that also did not um, uh, behave in the same way or exist on the same kind of plane. But what it gives us as a topic is an amazing um, uh, case study for looking at things that come up throughout celebrity culture, like this dance between publicity and privacy, right? So we're going to probably find that a number of uh, the different points will kind of connect around this idea of this uh, family that has this presentation of dignity, this need for control, that's another theme that comes up so much throughout uh, celebrity culture, um, but then at the same time functions entirely, doesn't, isn't, isn't known, has an has important uh, role to be seen by the public, which mm -hmm. can only happen through being mediated, which can only happen through uh, the photo opportunity, through this kind of staged moment that will then be disseminated um, through media. And we see this telling and retelling and retelling of these stories onto which we then project our own ideas, a kind of repository for this idea of national identity um, and, um, and, and, and so forth. So, OK, I'm a, a senior lecturer on the brilliant publishing media BA at um, Oxford Brooks. Mm -hmm. um, I teach on the magazine modules there, so my research examines so very many different aspects of consumer magazines in particular. So I look at consumer magazines, how they are now, but also within a very long and rich history, um, which takes in issues around <coughs> gender and celebrity and consumer culture and class, all of which, of course, in case anything to do with Princess Diana and the royal family. I will be looking at high plurality um, with Diana, and um, as I think she is now just a hyperreal construct, but bear with me, I will explain this. So to quote uh, David Cheney, the, um, and I think this is a good quote to start with, the British royal family can be regarded as a sort of mirror in which competing versions of Britishness, as well as everyday gendered and family identities are overlapping and lay articulated. So I think the royal family is a sort of personification of the state. They perform our nation's history. Uh, they are born into it, have little choice, and some seem to really relish the entitlement that this genetic destiny bestows upon them. Diana, although part of the aristocracy, was in many ways discovered. She provided a sort of linkage between the people and the royal family, who was a sort of great institution. Um, this is exasperated by her demotion when they removed her HRH status, um, which at the time I remember thinking, was, was really petty and made her more, even more of a victim. And also highlighted, I think, her somewhat misuse by the, by the family, as many will have speculated on and still do, which I find extraordinary that, again, this story and this person and this tale is still being consumed. What I noticed recently in one of the many Diana specials that I bought this summer is that the content hasn't really changed. If anything, the myth has just grown. We have people giving their memories of her, which are now so old, 
we have the usual pictures, we have the usual fables, we have the usual um, tall tales, we have the usual suggestions as to what she was like as a person, but of course she's always very nice, she's always very caring, she's always very sweet. Um, I think 20 years from now we'll have people remembering how she healed the sick and the blind down on Oxford Street, but not quite yet. Um, and what struck me as really says so much about our view of celebrity and our view of the royal family is one of these um, pages, one of these um, picture montages of Diana's memory, so we could all kind of consume her memory, was just a picture of her dresses. Um, and they were um, on mannequins. And I just thought we've got to a stage now whereby we remember Diana through the things that she consumed. So how does hyperreality work? Well, you take all of these images, all of this social um, narrative, all of this historical narrative, you take all these images, images and images, decades of them, centuries of them, that have just slowly worked their way through um, societies. As society evolves, we take our pictures with us, and we add more and more to this kind of never-ending um, pile, and then we collapse them. We flatten them, we mingle them, we squish our knowledge, we squish what's true, we make up our own truths. We basically blend them so that there is no original in the end, there is no referent. We just get um, a squished version of our own truth. And I think this is what is happening with um, Diana now. And I think one of the lasting, um, lasting legacies of Princess Diana is what the magazines um, became after her death, because obviously the media felt awful, they felt somehow responsible, the public blamed them. They would blame the newspapers, they blamed the magazines, they blamed the paparazzi. There was lots of hand-wringing, because remember, a great deal of money was made um, uh, about her and judging her and thinking about her and commenting on her. And afterwards, and I think a lot of people in the media saw the outreach and the, the spectacle of public mourning with her funeral, and I think we see this now with every celebrity on the cover of every magazine, especially when it comes to weddings. Everyone wants a fairy tale wedding. They all want romance. They all want the fairy tale images. They all want the tiaras. I think we're seeing Princess Diana have a much different lasting legacy in terms of celebrity and the princess. My name's Anne and I work at the BBC as a planner. I sort of translate insight and sort of make it actionable for people who create content and for people who market and stuff like that. So just at the core, everything I do is about the audience. So the measure of public opinion to the monarchy is one of the most stable measures of a public opinion that exists in this country. <laughs> so what we see is with times and changes in technology, lots of opinions change, but what we've seen with the opinion around the monarchy, it's, it's pretty much the same. So when we sort of polled, so this is not me, uh, it's sort of Maury, who do a lot of the polling for um, the UK, when we polled, um, when they polled the UK to sort of say, you know, should we have a monarchy? What you saw was 18% said no, you know, we should have a republic. And then fast forward in 2016, you're actually seeing a slight shift where 17%. So actually, you're seeing a downward trend in terms of, well, it's not quite a trend because it's 1%, but what you're seeing is a consistency that actually people still like and still have, like having the monarchy. So within the BBC, um, what we see is big royal events still really drive big audience numbers to TV, online, and to print as well. So in the UK, so 37.4 million tuned into the Royal Wedding on the 29th of April. So compare that to the biggest show last year, which was Bake Off, which was 14 million. You can see that basically half the population, which is a huge number, tuned into the Royal Wedding at some point. Um, likewise, it also helps drive a lot of traffic to the BBC website as well. So when we had the announcement of um, Prince George's arrival, um, we had 20 million unique browsers globally um, in terms of those guys going towards this sort of content. And also I saw recently Hello uh, magazine, and you, know, you probably know a lot more about this, mm -hmm. but um, one of the articles I saw recently from the editor, they said that what they've managed to do is stem quite a lot of the decline that you've seen in print media versus competitors like Heat magazine, because what they focused on 
solely has been royal coverage and that's actually been enduring over time. So one of the questions I always get asked, because I actually specialise in working on young audiences, like, is it really just like old people like this dude that like the royal family? Are these the guys that actually are propelling this and actually are these the sort of people that are consuming this sort of content? But actually, when you look at the figures, um, what we do know is that no, actually young audiences really like that content as well. So we know that the birth of Prince George, Princess Charlotte, the Queen's 90th, were some of the biggest clicked on news stories of those 18 to 34. So actually, what you're seeing is a kind of resurgence, um, if, if, if we well, if describe it as that, um, for the royal family. And particularly, um, the Queen's enduringly popular but much of that younger support, unsurprisingly, has been driven by the younger royals, um, particularly uh, Prince William, Harry and Kate. Um, and they're really well liked amongst that younger demographic. And part of that will be because they're young and they're kind of at age, but also they've got their sort of foot in, hey, I'm an everyman as well as I'm a royal and I can be just like you. So really, in amongst all this, how important is the royal family to the British public as a whole? Like, do they actually really care or are they just loving bits of insatiable gossip? So one of the polls that was done recently by Ipsos was to get people to list, so this is the whole population, not just younger audiences, to list the top things that make us proud to be British. <laughs> and actually, the royal family featured really highly up. So beneath the NHS and our history, 31% of that population uh, that were polled said that the royal family is something that makes them proud to be British. And before you guys sort of sort of sit there incredulously and wincing of why this would be, um, because actually some of the stuff on here is really important, you know, the free press, our culture and the arts, the BBC, uh, our position in the world, British business, all that sort of stuff. Um, what I think, so why is it that the royal family has stood the test of time amongst the public? Um, and I think partly, and Leander sort of, um, sort of mentioned this as well, so whatever you think about them, um, it's undeniable the power they have to unify and bring us together. Look at the excitement around the Jubilee, the Royal Wedding, those big events. So why have they, but yes, but, but because of that, so why else have they stood the test of time? So part of that can be attributed to them being a more open family, reflecting sort of family dynamics that we have, having those more younger, more modern royals. But I think it's bigger than that. I think the royal family are kind of a barometer on sort of modern Britain and they've evolved to reflect and to sort of mirror the values that modern Britain, have to, Britain has today. I'm Bridget Dalton, and I'm a recovering academic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's my favourite joke. Um, I'm a semiotician, right? I'm that. My background is in studying poetry, but I moved into industry where I practice commercial semiotics, which is a type of cultural analysis that looks at all manner of cultural texts, that's magazines, music videos, fashion, food, spaces, clothing, anything like that, in order to extract the narratives that are most important to us. Um, and then we can determine which narratives will be emergently important and we can sell that information so that brands can communicate <laughs> with you as saliently as possible for the longest time possible. So I'm your friend and your enemy. So in my practice I'm looking for signs and decoding them and extracting from those the larger narratives that are at play. And Diane is a really, really, really interesting sort of case study for me because She's all, often, by her detractors and her fans, considered to be a really effective architect of her own public image. But as you can probably agree, each of these images is communicating a pretty distinct meaning. Um, but for me, today, I'm looking at what does Diana mean in 2017, and where I go to look is the magazine racks. Um, so I can put Diana in the cultural context that we find her in. Um, and here she is in one of those cultural contexts that I mm. talked to you about. But here she's dripping in pearls, there are pearls in her eyes and on her lips, and we have that dark blue cursive text that suggests some kind of feminine elegance and her legacy. And then we have life as a princess, mother, humanitarian, and fashion icon. And what the reason I'm looking at that picture is I'm interested in the context in which she's presented. And this is a kind of angelic, highly valuable, 
perfect, naturally occurring, because we're pearls and platinum, um, princess. So with The Guardian, we have Diana as a, as a kind of critical model for understanding how we make our own myths as a nation. We're not, no one's tricking us here. We've got, we understand that we do this, right? But that's the Guardian's kind of um, remit to tell us about how clever we are or how we're thinking about things. And we have these kind of oblique images of Diana, one's painted, one's of her in a cab, she's driving away. But um, <coughs> I will say that the, the kind of important thing is that what is happening culturally for me, so when I'm saying Diana is hyper-real, Diana, Diana is a myth of womanhood, of motherhood, she's also a model by which we, the British public, understand how we make myths. And that's a really, really interesting critical leap, in my opinion. So she kind of works as a model for understanding. And I just want to quote Mantel. They are not people like us, but with better hats. <laughs> they, sorry, I really couldn't resist, and that's the, one of the reasons I said yes to this. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, OK. They exist apart from utility and by virtue of our unexamined and irrational needs. You can't write or speak about the princess without explicating and embellishing her myth. Mm. And that's not hidden knowledge. That's not even particularly advanced critical knowledge, but it's public knowledge. It's where we're at and where we're understanding things. So what's interesting about this representation of Diana, this contextualizing of Diana, is there's no royalty. There's no monarchy in this representation. It's this kind of successful femininity. It's beautiful, it's editorial, it's quality. There's Mario Testino. And then you have the rest of the context, which is cool fashion and midlife fitness. So <laughs> Diana is, represent is an aspirational figure in that sense that we are also paying a very special, but not royal, but kind of hum human tribute to. So in, in part of the Diana myth, a part of the Diana meta-narrative is a complete identification. She's one of us, mm. right? And that's really, really crucial. So I'm trying to sort of look at the three dominant narratives for how Diana functions in the magazine rack in 2017. But we have new fandoms. There's this, millennials, some millennials are super duper into Diana. There's <laughs> Princess Diana Forever, the Instagram account that has 174,000 followers. There's this amazing meme, or well, I don't know whether it's amazing, it's kind of lame, I think, but in a world full of Kardashians, be Diana. <laughs> wow. Be, be shot in black and white, or be white, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but then you have Rihanna, the you know, quintessential bad gal, sporting a Diana t-shirt. So Diana is becoming a rebellious icon. She's also being reflected in soft grunge fashion. So last year, ASOS and Wa Nails produced an, an entire range of clothing based on her iconic looks. So what I'm trying to de describe to you is how she's a myth and she moves through culture and we redefine her. Hello, I'm Jack Royston, I'm a journalist with The Sun, and at the moment I'm The Sun's royal correspondent. Um, and that means that I follow, follow the royal family around for a variety of events they do, um, which are generally kind of these stage-managed PR things, um, what they call engagement. So you go along and you stand where you're supposed to stand, and they come and talk to a load of ordinary members of the public and the press try and sort of hear what they're saying and um, make stories out of it in the next day's papers. And um, more recently, I've been writing a lot about, uh, about Princess Diana. Um, but the royal family are a very, very interesting point at the moment because they're at a crossroads between two eras, the very long uh, era of the Queen and um, the new era of her grandchildren. And um, that's perfectly encapsulated in two of the big stories we've had this year. On the left, you've got the retirement of Prince Philip, um, this kind of stalwart of the old era, um, a controversial figure, but very much a symbol of the kind of stiff upper lip. And on the right, you have one of the other big stories um, of this year, which is Prince William and Harry talking about their emotions, specifically in relation to the death of their mother. Um, the headline, Stiff Upper Flip, is in relation to a comment William made, that um, the stiff upper lip has its place, but not at the expense of your mental health. Um, Princess Diana's former private secretary at the time that she died um, told me a week or so ago 
that he um, refers to Philip the Queen and Prince Charles as the Stiff Upper Lip Brigade. Um, so it's very much seen that way inside the palace as well as outside. Um, and so a very significant comment um, for that reason. And uh, that change means that the future of celebrity for the royal family looks very different to how it looked before. In one of the, obviously there's been a whole series of TV documentaries, and in one of them, Harry tells this story about how he was, um, he was out in Barbados, I think it was, with Rihanna, um, trying to tell people there, spread the message there about using contraception and getting um, tested for AIDS. And um, he's talking about it and says how, how happy and pleased he was that he was able to secure Rihanna to do this event with him. Almost as though he was the kind of behind the scenes charity <laughs> organizer who was hoping to get a big name on the team sheet. <laughs> Clearly he was the big name on the team sheet. Um, and uh, what it made me think is that, as Anne said, you have um, lots of celebrities who do these things, who um, perform these charitable functions, who try and save the world. But the key thing about the royal family is that that is all they do. And they do, on the other hand, what the government wants them to do, because they, when they go abroad, they go, people don't necessarily know this, but the tours they go on, they have absolutely no control, really, over where they go. Um, it's all decided by the Foreign Commonwealth Office. And so the way I see this is it's kind of like a form of nationalised celebrity. Um, they perform for the state the functions that uh, uh, people like Rihanna perform privately, and thereby they do it in a way that is compatible with what the state wants and what the charity sector wants as well. Um, and I think that's a very interesting uh, idea, and it's one born entirely out of Diana's legacy. Um, as I said before, she uh, had the same approach of kind of uh, Prince Charles it wants to save the environment, which is a form of wanting to save the world, but it doesn't involve engaging with other human beings. It doesn't involve kind of sh sharing your emotions and gushing publicly, and it doesn't involve putting yourself out there. It involves writing private letters to ministers that you don't want the public to ever see, and that can only be extracted from government departments through the Freedom of Information Act. Um, so uh, it's, it's all Diana's legacy, and um, it presents a bit of a problem for Prince Charles because one of the other big stories we've had over the last month, if you look on the left, obviously Prince William hasn't become king. Um, what that headline is intended to convey is the fact that 50% of people who we polled said they would rather Prince William become the next king than Prince Charles. Um, Prince Charles got only 22% of the vote. And um, one thing that makes this uh, particularly interesting is that we also might be at a crossroads politically um, we had a long period of centralization in politics and politics is now um, polarizing again and one of the figures on that electoral landscape is Jeremy Corbyn, a lifelong Republican. Um, so we potentially could be imminently about to arrive in an era where um, the Queen got a bit passes away, Charles takes her place the public don't like him very much. He's not very good at endearing himself to people. Um, and subsequently, you then have Jeremy Corbyn elected as Prime Minister. Um, it would be very interesting to see how the statistic that Anne showed you would change under those circumstances. But there is still, in spite of the fact that a lot of the stuff that's been published is not, strictly speaking, new, bre breaking one of the fundamental laws of journalism there is still an enormous, enormous appetite among people to read it. Um, there, you know, it's been making front pages because people are still very, very interested to read about that. And what about this challenge of uh, the new line? Because of everyone here, you're mm -hmm. the one that actually has actually to has struggle to, yeah. with that demand. Well, um, uh, Princess Diana has always been a kind of story about her emotions and people's emotions and one way that you can uh, tell the story in a new way 20 years mm. on is through how people's um, emotions have changed mm. uh, over the years. People have new insights um, into this thoroughly told story. I mean, you can't really lend that much new insight on the circumstances of how she died because it has been poured over in so much detail. But um, when I was um, speaking to, to Michael Gibbons, who was very close to her at the time and was convinced that the relationship was going to disintegrate within month, well, within weeks, in fact, because it was the end of August that she passed away, 
Um, Mohammed Al Fayed at the time promoted very strongly the notion that they were about to, or that in fact they had become engaged and she was pregnant. Um, Michael Gibbons had never done an interview before, so this was his first foray into it. And um, as somebody who was alongside her at the time, not literally, but who wa was working for her at the time that she died and helped with the funeral preparations and you know everything afterwards, it's significant that he's saying this for the first time. He has an emo he has an emotional experience of this story that is unique to him. Thank you. Uh Bridget and Leander, you both, so Leander, you just said, um, this raised this idea of Diana as a, somehow framed as an anti-establishment figure, um, which connects to how her image is being used mm. in those examples you gave us as the kind of grunge, uh, it's such mm. extraordinary repurposing uh, as a grungy icon um, for bad gal Ruri. Mm. Um, <laughs> so I was just wondering if, Two of you have any more more to say about this kind of strange, um, yeah, well, reappropriation, repurposing, reframing. I wonder if she's also useful in terms of directing the people's general distrust of the state. Mm. Mm. Do you know? And it'd be, yeah. I'd be interested to know if Anne has any. Since you know what everyone feels about everything, <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> and um, I'd be interested to know how people view the state. Has their trust in the state diminished? Particularly for younger audience, yes. Yeah. So what you see is, particularly those eighteen to thirty-four, when we sort of see any data or poll polls, there's a particular distrust of the establishment mm. and brands as a whole. Mm. So. What you see is um, any sort of thing they see as the establishment, they distrust. Yeah. Any sort of big multinational brands, they distrust as well. It's, yeah. m you can see a huge difference between the younger guys and the older guys. So. Yeah, but I, I also think because she lives as in these images, what, you've, what I've found looking, just sort of looking around the internet, which I do all the time. Love the internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> her fabulousness has endured and is important and her that I'm I wonder whether I think that you're absolutely spot on about her as a kind of as a signifier as a of of, of a fuck you mm. right with a with the kind of mm. fabulousness of it there's also um the, I mean, there's a basic fact that everyone's super nostalgic about the 90s yeah. Yeah. right now. It's a yeah. very so, good moment, so, really. So yeah. she, 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 but she's... On she's, trend. Exactly, she's super on trend, but she's, she's, also, she's also really young. Mm. She was in her... She was just like 36 when she died. So for millennials, people like me, I was talking to my sister the other day and we were remembering the day she died, and that's a conversation that people in my generation had and uh, as an icon that distinguishes yeah. us from the, the generation that comes after us and almost from the from the, the kind of involved politics that we sort of missed because mm. we were too young for she sort of sort of sails slightly ahead of that and she, but she's also frozen right like mm. any icon she's just stuck at 36 mm. and therefore she always looks fabulous mm. And I think, but I, and I mean, I think you're right. I think it's very political, but I think that it's the, it's sort of that, that it, you know, to sort of go back to a, a theme from the last time, there's an element of camp about being fabulous in the face of adversity. Mm. And that's what the revenge dress is. Mm. And that's what, you know, if these are my, if, if these are this, these are my tools as a woman, mm. then I'm going to really fire the engine up. And that's yeah. the kind of I think that that's one of the the, the kind of narratives that's being replayed mm. these days, or um, amongst kind of mm. hip young things. But th those coded references in her outfits, mm. which again are being reflected on. Do you remember when Diana said that to the establishment or that mm. to Prince Charles? This is not new. If you go around the National Portrait Gallery, go mm. upstairs when no one goes favorite bit and you see all those portraits of the kings and queens of England especially the women yeah. there are so many codes embroidered into everything that mm. they wore the use of pearls and pearls is a very old um, reference to kind of purity and innocence as well you know all these codes she tapped into mm -hmm. which leads me to a theme which I've noticed increasingly with, Di with the Diana myth is the outrageous sexism uh, used mm. Uh, especially in terms of motherhood. 
And I've got this lovely quote which I, I found from a paper which is by Helen Damon Moore that says, women were responsible for love, a notion clearly consistent with 19th century ideals. So in all the magazines that I look at, you know, especially when it comes to uh, royalty and, and the, the consumer magazines in the um, uh, late Victorian era in particular, you have these, these aristocracy um, ladies of the aristocracy, these special royalty, they always, they're always good. And I think what I've noticed in, in um, all the media um, discussion about her is her sainthood seems to have just been elevated mm. now. You know, I, I'm sure 100 years from now, she'll be a relic. You know, if you touch a sort of a toe bone, you will be healed from gout, you know. <laughs> but, but her sainthood is a modern sainthood. It accommodates mm. divorce mm. And, and other relationships and accommodates even this, this, the, 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 the ne this necessary separation of her leaving her children. She died. It was a, it's mm. a terrible thing. Mm. But it, it's almost, it even accommodates the absent mother. Mm. She, she's, the, that, for that reason, it's, 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 all, it's kind of absorbing the necessities of modern sainthood, modern mm. female sainthood. That, and, that, and that kind of camp fabulousness mm. that isn't restricted by pearls, but is, is empowered by them. I mean, these, and these are kind of pretty like I'm talking broad strokes and it's mm. co very complicated. But that absorption is, is the, but it's the effect of the public, of the public, of public perception. So let's compare that with um, what Anne was saying about the kind of growing conservatism, small c, mm. um, amongst young people and compare that quite unruly myth of, and flexible mm. myth and sometimes anti-establishment and rebellious myth and, and whilst absolutely smashing everything that it is to be a successful woman under certain contexts, also kind of stretching perhaps um, in, in other ways. Um, with Kate Middleton, mm. you know, the next generation of um, kind of, uh, femininity figurehead for the royals, yeah. um, which as yet, of course, that's a story that's not written yet, um, but is so mm. comparatively um, restrained, uh, which I mean both literally, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, what we see as good behaviour and actually restraint as being, you know, forcibly contained, right? Mm. There's uh, much tighter parameters around that set of myths around that woman. Interesting in terms of oh. being constrained, um, Meghan Markle, who is potentially going to be entering the royal household, um, certainly if you believe the rumours anyway, uh, has already closed down her, or she stopped tweeting, closed down her blog, and is clearly, she's supposed, <laughs> supposedly going to not be doing um, suits anymore, which is an actress, for anyone who doesn't know, in a uh, US TV show or a Canadian TV show called Suits. Um, and she supposedly is going to be withdrawing from that as well, so she mm. is preparing to kind of close down her own, well, life, mm. really. Well, it's her own brand, isn't it's it? Because brand. she's going to be re-emerging as brand Windsor. Yeah. So mm. she has to get rid of her old life and all that surrounds it to mm. prepare for her swan-like transformation. And this is the woman, uh, and also Kate Middleton was hailed in the same way as being another modernising mm -hmm. force because, you know, Kate Middleton was re-stresses and... Um, uh, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and supposedly ordinary middle class um, background, um, supposedly <laughs> ordinary. Uh, so ordinary. <laughs> yeah, again, and then, you know, Meghan Markle, um, yeah, the modernising force of, of, mm. of a mixed race woman. Mm. Um, the American divorcee as well. Mm. Who was a homecoming queen at her LA private school. Of course, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's one of us. Yeah, <laughs> Just totally. One of us. Yeah. <laughs> so touchable, which is going to be my next que question. And, uh, but yeah, so there are, there's this next generation um, of women who are hailed mm. as um, modernising forces, but actually compared to what you're saying about... Um, Diana's kind of unruly myth. Um, She's embraced by the punk. It's Reese versus ASOS. <laughs> the, the young kids, are, you know, the hipsters love Diana. They can't be bothered with Kate. Because also ironic nostalgia sure. as well. Right? Yeah. There's not a lot of space for irony and camp around Kate yet. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> I, I, I think Kate takes it very, very serious. 
She takes she takes it very seriously. Joke. It really is. But I thought it was a stroke of of uh, genius. Obviously, there's an emotional attachment to um, his mother's engagement ring. Um, personally, for me, I think I would have had the whole thing melted down and <laughs> I think it's cursed. But um, Kate Middleton wearing that huge sapphire, that iconic. And coming back to what Bridget's looking at, these these iconic. Um, these little icons, they mean so much. What does that ring mean? I think Kate Middleton is very sensible to wear that ring because it reminds the press to back off. Yes. It, it reminds them um, of what they did. Sorry, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it reminds everyone of how much they speculated mm. about her mother-in-law, how much we, you know, we as a nation, as, as part of a society, we all contributed to the Diana myth in some way. And I think the sapphire works as a, as a sort of talisman, yeah. really. I think it And Diana her. as a talisman mm. of, um, you know, this is... Yeah, yeah, back, back, back off because yeah, and I, and I think it makes her worthy of her notoriety and fame. I think mm. it, it, she's, um, she has sort of natural fame. She has fame that is earned through again her motherhood. Um, you know, she's you know a, a natural proper woman because you know she has, you know, birthed children <laughs> that will inherit the title. But such a um, neat bum. Yes. <laughs> I think she copped one. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and I think there's the, the symbolism in that sapphire is something you could actually just write an entire book mm. around. Mm. Funnily enough, um, and so you have written this book. <laughs> yeah. Look out for Friday. And not on the sapphire, but um, on Kate um, and kind of a hyper real version of her. Mm -hmm. um, at the time that the royals were doing, that the young royals were doing this oh, It's OK to Say campaign, um, the mental health campaign they did in the run-up to the marathon where they spoke about their emotions and feelings and so on, um, Kate went on various engagements where um, she spoke to other mothers who would, um, there was one in particular who had suffered quite severe postnatal depression. Um, and she, would, she made several comments along the lines that um, you get all these people posting of their Kate made come on, these people that um, you get all these people posting on Instagram these perfect pictures of their perfect families, um, and it's just not motherhood isn't like that. Mm. And as the per, as the journalist who's standing where the press officer has told them to stand, um, <laughs> it's surrounded by photographers who you know are seeing Kate Middleton during a kind of forty five or twenty to forty five minute allotted time, but after which she'll be whisked away um, by an army of uh, you know. Um, on, on, by her huge entourage. It's an extraordinary comment to um, have a go at the other people who have a, <laughs> a polished <laughs> a version polished of themselves. <laughs> yeah. Three facts about Charles, I think, which I think are uncontentious. He is a traditionist. He is somewhat less popular than his mother, but he's slightly more popular than his wife. Perhaps this is a question for Jack. Come on. Do you think people around Charles kind of give him a head to up on this? Is he aware he's going to have problems later on? Is he just aware? Yeah. There's, um, there's a very interesting story that his, that Diana's, um, one of her other royal protection officers, a man called Ken Wharf, tells about how she had done an event up in Newcastle and um, she'd come back down to London. It was late in the evening. Prince Charles was about to set off to do... Um, a tour around some of the churches that he works with and um, she apparently felt sorry for him and said would you like me to tag along so you're not by yourself and um, he, he said no because they'll only care about you <laughs> um, I, don't, uh, I don't know if they actually need to tell him about it because I think he's acutely aware of it himself um, and I think it probably I mean I, I would imagine it's something that you would want to be quite careful bringing up with him. Um, <laughs> I imagine it's a thorny subject, but um, I'm sure it does get talked about, and strategies for dealing with it do get talked about. I was interested in what uh, Yandra was saying, and I think some of you were sort of getting at it, about the myth of Diana. And the more we buy into her kind of posthumous sainthood, um, we assuage our own guilt at her mm. downfall. Because we bought, you know, it, mm. it, it wasn't Jack's fault. <laughs> <laughs> it, 
was wow. we all <laughs> we all bought those magazines. Yeah. Um, you know, people read them. People looked at what she ate, how many times she <coughs> threw up. How, who she was sleeping mm. with, how see-through her dresses were, and criticised every inch of her body mm. and her life mercilessly when mm. she was alive. It wasn't she wasn't adored like this mm. when she yep. was alive. Mm. She was mm. criticised a lot, and she was held. You know, she. I remember the, one of the images that Bridget showed with the the two children, the skirt. A lot of the commentary about that was how inappropriate her, mm. self, her skirt was see-through. Mm. You know, she kind of... She, <laughs> she was, didn't have a slip-on. She didn't have yeah. a slip-on. Yeah. She was inappropriate. She was, and mm. then when she dies, we all say, oh, it mm. wasn't she fantastic. Those evil paparazzi mm. killed her. They were terrible. No, nobody sort of says, why were they paid so much to chase her? Because there was a sort of rampant appetite mm. for her. Mm. And the, by, the more we deify her now, we can pretend mm. that that never happened. And we weren't part of the culture that destroyed mm. her as well. And I don't continue think, to be complicit yeah, in yeah. that culture around yeah, other yeah. famous women too. And yeah. I love the, the word the deity. I think she has become a deity. I'm um, 45, so I remember, um, so I was pretty, you know, formed and compassment as well. <laughs> but um, but I remember seeing um, the newspapers before she died, mm. and they had just moved on to criticising her mothering skills. And I remember this distinctly because at the beginning of the week there were loads of articles about what a terrible mother she yeah. was and how could she leave her sons and be partying and having fun. <laughs> you know, and then literally, bam, suddenly a terrible tragedy and everyone's going, oh shit, shit, you know, mm. so, and the tone changed. And what I think has happened and I think there was much hand-wringing. <laughs> I think it changed the way we consume celebrities. And I think that the magazines in particular, because remember this is the 90s, this is just the beginning of the rise of home internet use. You know, uh, magazines, celebrity mid-market magazines were bringing in, you know, 500 circulations of 500 plus, you know, uh, a week. They were massive, massive. And, um, and I think you've, with reality TV stars, and I think they started with Jay Goody, you have a lot of manufactured princesses. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, when you manufacture something and you own it and you create it, then you can do whatever you like with it. And that includes consuming it, being critical about their lives, um, judging them. And, but we can do this guilt-free because they're paid for that. Mm -hmm they're really performing a celebrity service. Is it almost that there is a sort of competing, like a slingshot narrative that happens? At one minute we have the deified Saint Diana and then mm. for, for, the, for a different, she serves a different generation, a different purpose. Yeah, and also and a different class, I yeah, would say, as totally. well. totally. Mm. I think yeah. the way that people consume Diana is riddled mm. with class and mm. riddled with a demographic. And I was just wondering how, out of all the broadcasters, Bearing in mind you've got ITV that enjoys a rather different attitude towards celebrity yeah. and reality TV and manufacture, they manufacture celebrities. Um, how, do, how, does, how does the BBC walk that kind of line of being the nation's broadcaster but still needing to comment about Diana? It's we've tricky because we've had a lot of it. flack from various different things that we've done. So it's it's like like the Royals, we, we are always walking a tightrope of like, is this too much or is this too little? And it's really, really difficult because I guess with Channel 4 or ITV, you can be much more sensationalised, whereas <laughs> with the BBC, obviously, it has to be a, lo a lot of balance. Mm -hmm. And it's quite difficult to keep tre treading mm -hmm. that mark. And we would have seen from the last stuff we did with... Um, Oh, the stuff that we got in loads of trouble for with the Queen stomping off. Do you remember? That was about mm. five, six years ago. There was at a bit the time I worked at Red Bean. Yes, the, you um, would have, yeah. Creative agency responsible. Oh, yeah, you made the ad. Brilliant. Mm. Um, so <laughs> it, Evil. Yeah. So, you know, it was like we were always mm. um, on that tightrope, right? So you wanted mm. to have something that draws people in and gets people excited and actually feeds the bees. But at the same time, you can't really annoy like the world and present something that isn't a correct or the right portrayal it's really yeah, tough and what's so interesting about that example is it was a question of how footage had been edited um and that was a photo shoot with annie Leibovitz. yes and it looked like she'd stormed off but actually she just yeah they edited in a way that yeah. made it look like she'd gone off in a half when actually it was it wasn't actually like that. And yet. if we take that logic with all of this Diana in her own words stuff, um, you know, uh, the idea that just because something is footage of the person 
saying the words or doing the thing and you can see it mm. the idea that there is no mediation mm. or construction or angle or framing mm. of that um, <laughs> it, every single time mm. that it's presented um, uh, is absurd um, but this one was done in such a way that it was particularly angering so, um, so really to the royal uh, core. So really we've got to the stage where we're questioning what is actually real so the media and the public have almost joined forces. We've now manufactured our own princess, our own realness, our own Diana. We're really, she's the absolute fake. There's so little, I smell her reality everywhere. <laughs> thank you so much for coming um, to support. And thanks hugely to our brilliant panel. Please join us in applauding them. The reason I came here today just to hear the different opinions and you know, I think whether people like it or not, people are very interested in celebrity culture. And the royal family, as was mentioned earlier, they exemplify that in its kind of highest form, really. It opened up my mind and made me think a bit differently about how I can approach this with students who are a lot younger, who consume that celebrity culture on a day-to-day -day basis in a way that even my generation hasn't done so before. I think the beauty of today's event is to give people a chance to have a, a dialogue about stuff that we don't often get to talk about. I can relate to usable uh, and real information from people and, 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 and actually, actual data that you find in these kind of events that is based on research and not in just general knowledge. I thought it was interesting to hear what other people had to say and to hear kind of people that study kind of media and culture, hear their input about it. I'd come along again because it's, I think it's so important to talk about these issues because they are far reaching, they are the, probably the biggest thing that goes on in, from my professional perspective in young people's lives is the media, is the way that they're portrayed and the way that they consume these images. Jack is an excellent speaker, Jack works the Sun, he's their royal correspondent and I think he gave us a clue about the reality of actually covering royal events. It, it helps us to have more information, more valuable information, to where we can relate and put in context our reports. So we would be very happy to come back to these kind of events. It is quite interesting and I think all of us, we talk about these things and we, you know, offline and in our personal lives. So yeah, it would definitely be something that I'd be interested in attending again.